Kimberly Austin. Welcome to Rock Book Show. And joining me today here in beautiful, bright Times Square is author Mark Spitz. Mark, this is like your sixth book, isn't it? It's my sixth, yes. So why did you decide to write this book? It, is it a companion piece or an answer to Keith Richards' life? And why did you think you were the guy to tell the story? Um, actually, it's, it's ending up sort of uh, being considered that way, which I think is, is fine. Um, but honestly, like, I remember when I started doing the book, life was literally like a rumor. Like there was still that pervasive suspicion, like does Keith Richards remember anything? You know, like nobody, they were keeping it under really uh, strict, tight wraps. And I was always like, okay, if the book exists and it comes out, A, it'll be helpful as a source for me, obviously, because uh, Keith had to disclose things about Mick and, and the objective of my book was to find out as much as I could about Mick. So. I was like, well, that would be valuable. I'll try and get an early copy, but that was that didn't even happen. I had to buy it, just like everyone else. Um, and it will um, sort of, I guess, yeah, tee up the sort of one side of the of the history of the greatest rock and roll band in the world, and it would leave a sort of, well, what does what does Mick say? And I don't know if you remember, like when um, when Life first came out last fall, there was a, a post in Slate. And it was sort of purported to be mixed rebuttal, and um, and it was obviously a, a, a fake, but it was very funny and it was very smart, and and it was so. I always sort of had that like that uh, idea that this was sort of like the serious version of the satire as, uh, that ran in Slate. But there is a sense of this might balance the scales a little bit. Um, but at the same time, it's it's not official Mick Jagger propaganda. <laughs> so know. it's not like you're trying to open a can of worms, nor a can of whoop ass. I wanted to start an argument, you know, I mean, I did. I wanted so it to is start. a can of whoop ass. For me, it's actual whoop ass. I will <laughs> kick, kick your ass. No, I mean, I just wanted, you know, like, um, the, the, the question that kept coming up, and it changes, and it really says a lot about where you are in your life, is, um, is uh, who would you rather be, Mick Jagger or Keith Richards? You know? And I think that was a, a very strong and very revealing question and it was something that I sort of wanted to explore because once you answer that then the next question is why mm -hmm. you know and I wanted to sort of equip people with being able to answer the why in a in a um, I wouldn't say the book is objective I think the book is slanted in mixed favor I, I would cop to that you know um, but only because of the sort of wild majority opinion that sort of has rendered him as this underdog in terms of cool currency you know I, I like an underdog. I like being contrary. I think it's very rock and roll to say, "Well, why is this a fixed idea?" I wanted to do a book that was that that was a kind of book that would that that would start a conversation, yeah. you know. So, yeah. and the, right in the title, you have rebel, rock star, rambler, rogue. What what is it about those four, four words that you thought were the perfect descriptors? Well, I was thinking about that the other day because um, my editor, Lauren Marino at Gotham, who is brilliant, um, she said. I wanted to call the book initially Gimme Mick, G-I-M-M-E mm -hmm. -M -M -E, Mick, and it's kind of after this song, this parody song that Gilda Ratner sang on Saturday Night Live in the late 70s, and it's explained in the intro to the book. Um, and ultimately, Gimme Mick was maybe considered too esoteric, so we were just decided to call it Jagger, but, but my editor wanted a subtitle, and she wanted it to be like Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy. And I was just like, at first I thought it was kind of cheesy, and now I think it's perfect. I really, it grew on me. And so I came up with the words. And then it's like, okay, well, Rambler, Midnight Rambler, obviously, but also that he, he kind of is not a fixed uh, uh, fashion icon. He's moved sort of consciously through the eras and whether he, what, you know, he's had periods where he was a leader. He had periods where maybe you could argue he was a follower. There's photos of him in punk rock t-shirts. Um, and, uh, rock star obviously uh, rebel that's the thing is like Keith is purportedly the only rebel so I wanted to sort of show how Mick was a rebel in a true sense and um, rogue is you know just read any tabloid report with his name and bold face and you know that's something that you I couldn't look the other way at you know well, what's your favorite Mick um, that's a hard question I mean I'm I, from an aesthetic point of view I'm partial to the sort of Mick of 65, you know, all those great old David Bailey shots and they look very mod and he's just beautiful and but it's like a new kind of beauty 
it's an ugly beauty or an androgynous beauty and and that it just takes your breath away still those photos and and the the, the fact that there's there's a, a chapter in the book about um how they changed from being just this badass blues band blues rock band to writing a song like as tears go by and kind of getting on board with the way that pop was going in the 60s which was uh exploring its male and female side, uh, having uh, uh, intellectually progressive ideas and just a pop sophistication that clearly through 65, 66, um, you know, they were, they, they were keeping pace with the Beatles and the Beach Boys and the Kinks. And um, so that, that's kind of my favorite Mick period just because it, I like the, um, the, uh, just the pure creativity that was going on. Yeah. Would your least favorite Mick be the unfortunate big ladies blouse Mick that you mentioned in the book? Oh, well, I... <laughs> <laughs> I love the way you do it. describe that. By the 80s, but, well, no, he was, to be, to be fair, 81, he was still super badass. I, I'm even partial to the, like, football pants, you know. <laughs> but there was a period in, like, 86 through, I would say, 89, and he sort of got right again. If you look at him now, the way, it's just basic black t-shirt, and, and he's in great shape, and it just, he just looks like a, a, a great front man, a, a capable front man. But there was that period and, you know, the 80s weren't, who are the 80s good for? You could find <laughs> photos of me from the 80s where I look. We won't post those. <laughs> so, but um, there was just something he did with his hair. There was something he did, there was like a, a, a weird um, casual Friday look going on. <laughs> so let's talk about Altamont for a minute because you bring that up in the book as a true turning point for Mick and, and that Mick was never the same after that. Well, there are people I interviewed in the book. Uh, there's a, a British music writer, a great British music writer called Mick Farron. And, um, and I interviewed uh, Albert Maisels, who is one of the co-directors of the film Gimme Shelter. Farron said, um, I lost respect for Jagger on that day because th there was uh, an opportunity to sort of, I guess, do what Keith did, which was to say, quit that or we're not going to play. And you know, Keith kind of escaped from that whole thing fairly unscathed, but um, it was argued by some people that I interviewed that they have a, a sort of Emperor's New Clothes moment for Mick. But then, but then you, have to, you have to remember, and, and one of the things uh, from talking to Mr. Maisels, who I was just so thrilled to, to talk to because that, that movie is, is, is so important, um, was that it was Mick who insisted on releasing the, the footage as is. He owned it, he could have buried it, you know, and he didn't, so we only know really in the sort of lasting documented if you weren't there but you can see the film sort of context how he behaved the 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 reality of it the humanity of it you did a lot of interviews with friends enemies and frenemies um what were some of your other and fans, in and, fans. Yeah. and what were some of your other favorite interviews on a personal level I mean, some of them were over the phone some of them were in person some of them were with people that i was um familiar with their work, some, some I, I just sort of uncovered over the course of doing the research. Um, you never know when writing a book, and, and I can say this from experience, um, who's going to be the, the money interview, you know, who's just going to be the one that just ties everything together. Um, and then you never know who's, who's going uh, to be the one where you're just like, okay, we're ready to go, you know, we're done, this can come out now. And for me, like the, the money interview was uh, probably this guy, Keith Altham who was an, a music uh, journalist in the very, very early days of the enemy and the British music press. Um, and then he became a publicist and he sort of crossed over into the other side of the industry, but had written extensively about the Stones, um, knew the Stones. It was one of those situations because he was in England, I had to set my alarm, you know, but it was like worth it, right? And so like, that was like the good sort of spackle interview where it filled in a lot of cracks and sort of said some of the things that I was sus suspecting but reluctant to write because I needed confirmation. It's a biography of ideas, you know, and, and so the, whoever brings a good idea, it's not just a this happened and this happened and this happened and this happened. Those are, those, there are plenty of those books that exist if you wanted them. Um, and then as far as like, okay, we're ready to go, man, <laughs> get this book out. Uh, I was, I was uh, home just, you know, futzing around twiddling my thumbs and the phone rang and it was Carly Simon and it was and, and I'm not saying it was like 
you know, I'm so and so's Car Carly Simon's assistant. Please hold for Carly. It was Carly. It was like anticipation. You know, uh, nobody does it better. Carly Simon, same voice, same exact voice, and. I was just like, oh, hold on, I like found it. It's like, how do I work my tape recorder again? How do I do, you know, the dogs are barking. And, um, but I got, I got a very good interview with her about it, a very important sort of period because it was a shift. It was, um, it was a shift in, um, in Mick sort of finally getting, or, or uh, you know, firmly getting, I would say is more accurate, beyond the Rolling Stones. You know, it's a number one song he's not credited on it, but his voice is unmistakable. And it's that moment where he's sort of becoming a celebrity and a rock star. I don't know that there were a lot, maybe you could argue Elvis, but there are very few of them um, where they're famous to, people know their faces who don't necessarily buy rock music. You know, and that was, he was one of the first. Now it's commonplace. Um, so it's getting her to talk. Um, I was, I was prepared, I'd been trying to get her forever. And I was prepared to just sort of use secondary sources because I knew the chapter was strong but once I had her in it and it was one of the last interviews for the book and she's Carly Simon she's like a legend you know I'm very grateful to her for taking the time to do that and, and also um, because I think because of the circumstance and when it came it, it was a uh, uh, one of the, the noteworthy interviews but certainly not the only only one you know. now Mick of course doesn't do a lot of interviews and if you could get him in a room and get him to be honest and, and um, blunt with you. What's, what's the one question you're dying to ask him? Well, I thought about that because I did interview him once when I was a, a, on staff at Spin. He was promoting a, a solo record, which I believe is his last to date solo record called Goddess in the Doorway, which Keith Richards called Dog Shit in the Doorway, famously. Um, I thought it was a pretty good record. I mean, I, I don't, I was a little s cynical about just, just peopling it with all these other hit makers like Wyclef and stuff like I don't think Mick needed to do that but um, but I did talk to him and it was shortly after 9-11 and we, we talked about they were about to play the um, concert for New York City Mick and Keith and they were talking about I was already talking to him about what songs he was going to play um, they ended up playing Salt of the Earth which I suggested but I'm not saying that that was why they played it could be though could be very very you know I have I have proof that I did suggest that um, and I, I asked him, I said, you know, do you ever wake up in the morning and, and say, oh my God, I'm Mick Jagger, you know, like, because I, I guess even then I kind of wanted to sort of, I was curious about the, the motivations and the, hum the, the context and, the, and this, the human behind the, the sort of, not even iconic, just super iconic uh, stature. And um, I mean, who is more famous than Mick Jagger? who is more culturally significant than Mick Jagger. And yet at the same time, nobody wants to be him. Like almost nobody thinks he's cool, especially when compared to Keith. Why is that, you know? So I, if I had to be in a room with him again 10 years later, I guess I would ask him, you know, probably if he, well, I, I, I would be curious if he, if the book was on his radar, obviously. I thought about, I th I'm still thinking about sending one with a note. I thank him in the, in the acknowledgments for, for the inspiration and the music. I blog on my own website, which is um, spitzbooks.com. And I, I blog extensively about the weird relationship between the subject and the, and the author when you're writing a, a profile of someone, even if it's a small magazine piece. So I can see that there's a distinct possibility that I would leave the room and not ask him anything. <laughs> <laughs> but you talked a little bit um, about inspiration, and I loved what you talked about in the book. Uh, first of all, you said, like Quentin Tarantino did with John Travolta, he brought out the best in him and showed him what was the best of him. And you said that about Rick Rubin. Rick Rubin yeah. yeah. There's a, a lost album, and there's a full chapter uh, on it in the book, uh, where in uh, 1992 or 93, or the early 90s, let's say, uh, Mick had just come off uh, the uh, a Stones, he was between really big Stones tours and he was doing a solo record with Rick Rubin and this was before, I think Rick Rubin had just produced the Chili Peppers but it was before Johnny Cash, it was before the sort of um, which, you know, this, this sort of iconic American recordings of Johnny Cash that sort of made people uh, sort of remember how wonderful Johnny Cash was and um, and uh, reminded people of the, the sort of national treasure that he was and Mick kind of was um, perhaps treat it, Rick wouldn't talk to me, uh, uh, perhaps treated similarly in that he cut a full blues record 
with Mick and this band called the Red Devils, who were a, a Hollywood bar band at the time. And I interviewed uh, this guy, Paul Size, who was their guitar player, about the whole experience. And so there is out there, and it's, it's a widely bootlegged CD. It's not like it's super obscure. You can get it. But there's a full, and it's great, um, blues album of Mick after his last solo record, which was called um, Primitive Cool. And it was sort of, it's very, uh, the critics didn't like it. There's some good songs on it, but um, it was very slick, you know? So to, just to get back to that sort of raw, blowing his harmonica and just singing his favorite old blues songs. Uh, I think if it came out in the early 90s, it might have changed the way that we think about him. It's worth seeking out. The Paul Size actually said that the re one of the reasons it, it wasn't released and, and uh, was that it didn't capture the sort of live feeling enough because uh, he did he did jam with them at this club in LA called the King King and um, and I guess well who knows I mean that one of the songs appears on, on his, a, a compilation of his of his uh, best of a best of compilation um, but yeah I wonder I wonder if it's something that's gonna get like an official release someday or it's it's definitely a uh, ahead of its time Th but that said the album that that he Mick did release the Rick Rubin record called Wandering Spirit is is amazing. I, I think it's widely considered the best Rolling Stones solo project. So right now, especially, how could you not say Mick Jagger is relevant when um, Maroon 5 has a number one song, Moves Like Jagger. Like there was just a number one song in England, Swagger Jagger, yes. last month. And I want to give the last question actually is from you, from the book. Who the hell is Mick Jagger and where does he go from here? Okay, well, I'll, I'll answer that question in, in, in two parts. One, um, like you said about life, I had no idea that any of that was, you know, going to be part of the zeitgeist by the time this book came out. There were indicators in terms of like uh, Ghostface Killa and some uh, and Kanye West um, sort of uh, uh, discovered that you could rhyme Jagger with Swagger, and uh, sort of pioneered that that rhymes. Uh, pairing the fact that it would become such an institution and that the when i saw the maroon five thing i was just like no way you know um but but then it, it sort of does make sense to me because he he is more in the pop consciousness than he's been credited for so this is just a, a high moment you know everything ebbs and flows over 50 years you're going to be in and out of fashion dozens of times and this is just it's it's uh, fortuitous for me that it's uh, the book is coming out at a moment where people are like even Cher Lloyd is like Swagger Jagger. Who didn't even win X Factor. Yeah, she was robbed. And as far as wh wh where who's going to go next, I, I, I finished the book before that super heavy project was even announced. So I sort of wanted to, I suspected that it would be a curveball, whatever it was. You know, everyone was expecting the Stones to sort of do another big tour. I think they probably still will next year when it's the 50th anniversary. Um, I can't see if, if, if everyone is healthy and you know can still play I can't I can't imagine but that's the thing it's like uh, where do they go next it's they're they're in a way they're pioneers again because there's no rule book for how a 70 late 60s 70 year old rock band operates so it's almost like they're showing us the way again McCartney too and and Dylan and Neil Young and those people um, who were still able to put on a good show uh, you know, I, I'm. I would see the Stones again. Would you? I mean, I would. I would. You know. The last chapter of the book is called. I believe it's called "On Stage with a Cane," which is a, after a quote in the early '70s that that Mick was asked by Dick Cavett uh, if he saw himself, you know, doing this when he was when he was old, and he said, "What do you mean going on stage with a cane?" And I think, why not? You know, the voice is still there. Why not? And not bad for a guy who only wanted to do this for a couple of years. The book is Jagger, Rebel, Rockstar, Rambler, Rogue. This is Mark Spitz, all the way from the West Village. Thank you, Mark. Representing the West Village.